Hey guys, I'm super excited about this project. Today we're building a 1000 MHz Athlon 64, Windows 98 and DOS retro gaming PC. Now the Athlon 64 tends to fly under the radar a little bit. Back in the day this processor wasn't just extremely competitive, especially in gaming and depending on the model, it was faster than the Intel Pentium 4. The Athlon 64 therefore became the choice for many gamers and it's a very interesting platform. We have two sockets, the entry level socket 754 and the more powerful socket 939, which had the faster dual channel memory controller and supported faster processors, including the FX range of expensive enthusiast processors. Putting this project together, it wasn't just smooth sailing. Like with most retro gaming PC projects, I did run into a few roadblocks, but in the end, it all worked out great and we will cover all of that. The finished PC ended up being more capable than I thought it would be. It also is a good example of working with what you have available, even though the parts chosen are not what you typically put on your retro parts shopping list. And this build is fantastic value. We often work with hardware on this channel that is quite difficult and expensive to obtain, but not this one. An Athlon 64 motherboard, processor and RAM should be easy to obtain. And the graphics card and the sound card are also readily available and affordable. Okay, I think it's time to start building this retro gaming PC, but we also have Windows 98 and DOS benchmarks. We will look at any CPU and GPU bottlenecks, enable anti-aliasing and anisotropic filtering to make those old games look even nicer. I'll show you how to more than double high resolution DOS performance. We have power draw measurements and we're using a PCI sound card that you can buy for around $10 that works great in Windows 98, but especially in DOS with a fantastic sounding FM chip. Before putting everything into a case, I like to build these retro systems on a test bench. It's just a lot easier to work with and I can swap parts really quickly. So we start with a motherboard. There are lots of options. It can be either socket 754 or 939, but it has to have an AGP interface, as this will let us use a huge range of Windows 98 and DOS compatible graphics cards. The chipset is also important. I wanted to use one from VIA. Motherboards with VIA chipsets are easy to find. The driver supports for Windows 98 is very good, and it also works great with the sound card we are using. The board I'm using for this project is the ASUS A8V Revision 2.0 with the K8T800 Pro chipset and the VT8237R Southbridge. I've used this board in a few projects already. It always worked great for me. It's got a nice layout, has a metal CPU backplate and all the BIOS options that we need for this project. The processor doesn't matter that much. It can be an Athlon 64 or a Sempron but it has to have cool and quiet support so that we can lower the CPU multiplier. Especially if you're using a socket 754 motherboard, do check that your processor supports cool and quiet. For example, not every Sempron processor does. A good place to check is Wikipedia. It has all the model numbers listed. We are using an Athlon 64 3200 plus with a rated clock speed of 2000 megahertz. A stick of 256 megabyte of RAM is all we need. That's plenty for Windows 98 SE, but 128 or 512 should work just as well. For the graphics card, we have a ton of options. So this depends greatly on what games you are into. I chose a GeForce 4 Ti video card. They offer a great balance of performance and compatibility with older games, as well as being readily available and also quite cheap. The GeForce 4 Ti 4200 is hands down the easiest to find, but any GeForce 4 Ti card will work great. I ended up going with a 4400 because that was the first card I found when digging into my video card container. The sound card we are starting off with, and make sure you do stick around because we will later change it for another model. So it is one of these generic PCI sound cards that you can pick up for next to nothing on eBay. It has the C-Media CMI8738 chip, has drivers for Windows 98 and DOS, comes with a game port and the usual inputs and outputs. The card doesn't have a CD-ROM audio input, so that's a negative as this is quite important to have for Windows 98 and DOS gaming. For storage, we are going with old school IDE. We have a 80 gigabyte drive from Seagate that is jumper as master 
and the DVD drive jumper to slave. I like using a single ID ribbon cable, I found it has little impact on the overall performance, but if that bugs you, just use two dedicated ID ribbon cables. Powering our machine is a XFX 450 watt power supply, but this machine doesn't consume much power at all, not even 100 watts under load, so any modern ATX power supply will work just fine. Before we install Windows 98, there are a few BIOS changes that I like to make. I start with loading the BIOS defaults and setting the date and time. I disable everything we don't need for this project, so we don't need the onboard sound, SATA controller, Ethernet controller, and the serial and parallel ports. Next, we're going to downclock and undervolt the processor. The lowest we can go is 800 MHz with a 4x multiplier, but for me, the machine wouldn't turn on with this setting. It does work just fine at 1000 MHz with a 5x multiplier. I lower the voltage to 1.2 volts. This will keep the temperatures a little bit lower, save some power and puts less stress on the motherboard. Now we boot from a Windows 98 SE CD. We use FDisk to delete any existing partitions and then create a new single 80 gig partition. We format that partition and then proceed with the Windows 98 installation. Next, we got to install a bunch of drivers. I started with the latest via chipset drivers, but got an error message telling me that the wizard was interrupted. I tried a few more times and I was about to try the drivers from the ASUS website. They are a little bit older, but after rebooting, it actually started to update the drivers anyway. So we are making some progress. Looking in the device manager, there's a conflict with the keyboard. This is because I have a wireless USB keyboard and mouse connected as well as a PS2 keyboard. I had to use a PS2 keyboard as the USB devices aren't working without the USB driver installed. We have two more devices that need drivers, the ID and the USB controller. After installing the USB 2.0 drivers, the wireless dongle for the keyboard and mouse got picked up and shortly after I was able to disconnect the PS2 keyboard as it wasn't required. Good tip, never hot plug PS2 devices, always turn off the machine first. And the last motherboard related driver is the VIA VRAID software package and after this we didn't have any errors in device manager anymore. So the graphics card drivers are next, and especially with NVIDIA cards, the version can matter depending on what games you are running. There's a common consensus when you research online that version 4523 works great with Windows 98, so that's what we're going to use. After a reboot, I installed also the CoolBits NVIDIA registry tweaks. This will unlock a few hidden options in the driver, especially the vSync controls, as we need that turned off before we can do any benchmarking. And we're also installing DirectX 7. Now it's time to load some benchmarks and games. Now if you're wondering how I load stuff onto this machine, well this machine has USB 2.0 so you can just use a thumb drive, but you have to install a USB storage driver first. And let the benchmarking begin, or so I thought, because when I started the Final Reality benchmark, I got an error telling me it couldn't find a 3D graphics card. 3D Mark 99 Max and 3D Mark 2000 told me the same thing. So I ran the DirectX diagnostics and it also threw an error when checking for 3D hardware acceleration. So this type of error I haven't encountered before. I remember having had quite a few issues with 3D graphics and Windows 2000, but Windows 98 pretty much always just worked for me. So at this point, it's a question of, are we dealing with a hardware issue or does the problem lie with software? So I started trying quite a few things. I reinstalled the chipset drivers. I manually updated the AGP driver. I tried all the AGP related BIOS options. I even swapped the graphics card. We started with a uh, GeForce 4Ti 4400. Now we're using a 4600. And after not making any progress, I tried a different graphics driver, version 5664, and that finally fixed it. Very odd problem, but we now have a working video card, so that's great. I quickly put all the BIOS options back to how they were before and off to some benchmarking while watching some Netflix. Okay, let's have a look at some benchmark results. We've got a few slides prepared here. First up, we've got Final Reality, 106 FPS in the robots test and 150 FPS in the city scene. Next up, we've got 3D Mark. We're getting around uh, 9,300 in 99 Max and uh, around uh, that's around 11,200 for 3D Mark 2000. Next up, we're gonna have a look at some games. They're all running at 1280 by 1024. It's just 
Quake 2 that runs at 1280x960 doesn't support the 1280x1024. And the first one we can see is basically all the games run at least 60 FPS. It's only Serious Sam. That's a quite a demanding game which runs at 52. But everything else we're getting decent FPS and GL Quake even well over 200. And a quick look at some bottlenecks. So here we have GL Quake and there's quite a lot going on in this graph. So we've got the FPS on the uh, left hand side here and these colored lines represent the benchmark results. So the blue one is default, no anti-aliasing, no anisotropic filtering. The orange one, this one here, I uh, enabled 8x anisotropic filtering. Then the gray one has 4x anti-aliasing and the yellow one has both 4x anti-aliasing as well as 8x anisotropic filtering. And this basically tells you we are GPU limited. So as we lower the resolution, the stress on the video card goes down and the FPS improves. And uh, when we turn on eye candy features, also the performance goes down. So here we have a GPU bottleneck. So um, in this game, a faster GPU uh, might give you extra performance. However, even with the highest eye candy setting, we're getting over 60 FPS. Now with bottlenecks, it depends a lot on the game. Here we have a different game, uh, Expendable. And look at that, all the results, they're basically the same. So this screams CPU bottleneck. And in order to find out what's going on, because the uh, anti-aliasing result, that one should be lower, but it's not. So what you can do, you can go into the bias, um, change the multiplier, and we're running now at the full 2000 megahertz, and we can now see a separation. However, the anti-aliasing results, uh, the, uh, that one here is identical with uh, no anti-aliasing. So this game basically doesn't work with anti-aliasing. It just ignores the driver setting. But we are getting slightly lower performance with um, an isotropic filtering. So yeah, that's how you look for bottlenecks. Um, put it in a graph and you can kind of tell if it's a CPU or GPU bottleneck and then you can take it from there. But once again, in Every setting we're getting uh, above 60 FPS, even with the CPU running at only 1000 megahertz. And we have some DOS results. And just looking at this, the lowest result, 126 FPS. So this machine will take any DOS game and will run it really well. At 640x480, the performance is not that great, but we will turn on fast vid later. So Chris's 3D Bench, that works fine. But in Quake, we're only getting 26 FPS and the processor is capable of a lot more. And here we have DOS games running at 640 by 480, but with uh, fast vid turn on, which is the orange result. So this shows you how important it is that you run fast vid with high resolution DOS games. The performance more than doubles and Quake is now silky smooth at 73 FPS. And we also have DOS results with the level one cache disabled. You can use the set mal utility. Uh, why do you want to do this? Well, the level one cache, if you turn that off, the CPU will become very slow which is good for uh, those old speed sensitive games. So looking at the 3D bench result, we're getting uh, 38. That is quite fast. So we're talking, that's around of a level of a DX250 thereabouts, yeah. So for older games like, like Wing Commander Test Drive 3, this is still too fast. We have to use something like uh, Throttle to slow it down further and we will have a look at that uh, later in the video. But um, other games that are speed sensitive, I believe um, Comanche is one of them, or Theme Park, they should run really well uh, with the caches turned off. So Windows 98 games run really well on this machine. And if you do run into a CPU bottleneck, well, you can just change the multiplier to unlock some extra performance. Now, next we're going to talk about the sound card. And I ended up spending a lot of time mucking around with getting things to work. So I wasn't able to do much in terms of Windows 98 gaming, but we do have footage of Need for Speed Road Challenge. I got a copy from the sold out label. I really like those as they include the latest patch on the CD. At first the game wasn't running well, but turns out it has a little program that you need to run and turn on 3D graphics support. After this, the game worked just fine. Anyway, back to the PCI sound card with the C-Media CMI 873A chip. And this is the second roadblock we ran into. The drivers installed just fine. In Device Manager, we can see the legacy Sound Blaster device as well. But whenever the sound card would play any audio, this really strange interference type noise could be heard. We have an example here while running the expendable benchmark.
Now I spent a lot of time trying to get this to work. I muted all inputs in the mixer, I tried all the options in the supplied software, I tried some bias options like PCI latency settings, I tried a different PCI slot and I swapped out the sound card. I usually purchase two or three of the same item because this lets me swap them out to diagnose issues like we're seeing here. Now under DOS I got the same issue but eventually I got the interference to go away and I'm not quite sure what I did but this was just under DOS, under Windows the issue remained. A real shame as the DOS compatibility wasn't that bad, the mixer software was actually really nice and it sounded pretty decent. Here we have a few games in MS-DOS mode and what they sound like on the CMI8738. So eventually I gave up and I switched out the sound card. This one is also readily available on eBay for $10 or so. This one has a chip from ESS, it is the ES1938S, also known as the Solo One. With this sound card we now had clear audio, but the drivers were a little bit more challenging, especially for DOS. Checking out these PCI sound cards in more detail is for another video, but the drivers I ended up using are from Terratech, a German company that did a lot of sound cards back in the day and they still have all the drivers on their website. Those drivers worked great and it included the DOS drivers as well. Under Windows you get the usual 16-bit 48kHz digital audio, but MIDI is quite interesting as well as the chipset has ESFM and MIDI files can sound better than Yamaha Opel 3. The DOS drivers worked great for me, there wasn't any mixer software supplied, but the older DOS mixer from older sound cards work just fine with this one. This machine has amazing performance for DOS games. At 320x200 I'm sure it runs everything you throw at it and after running FastVid it will run your high resolution games just as well. In the background we have Screamer Rally running at 640x480 and we have 65k colors. This game uses CD audio music and with the sound card having a CD audio input this also worked fine under DOS. The VIA chipset is also fully supported by Throttle, a DOS slowdown program. I only briefly tested it and it worked great. Here we have Wing Commander, a very tricky game to run uh, at the correct speed, but it works just fine. There are a few hitches every now and then, but in terms of playing the game and being able to hit the enemies, it works beautifully and the FM music is glitch free and sounds good. So we're getting towards the end of this video, I'm really keen to hear what you think. I was positively surprised at how everything turned out, especially the DOS compatibility really surprised me. To me this is kinda a little bit of a breakthrough and yeah I'm eager to see what you think. Windows 98 also runs extremely well on this machine so we have a really nice hybrid machine and you should be able to play a wide range of games. Regarding power draw, in DOS I'm measuring around 70 watts at the wall when playing games. Windows 98 was a little bit more power hungry with the video card playing more of a role and we're seeing around 80 to 85 watts. Now we did run into a few roadblocks but eventually we got everything going. So there you have it, this is a machine that shouldn't cost you much to replicate and it will run a wide range of games including excellent DOS compatibility. If you have any questions or comments please leave them down below. As always if you found this video interesting and want to see more please subscribe and click on that notification bell. Give it a like, share it with your friends and thanks for watching, I shall see you soon with another one.